The question now is how? How does proton accumulation and acute metabolic acidosis, as well as inorganic phosphate accumulation, cause acute muscular fatigue during post anaerobic threshold hypoxic situations? In other words, how do they cause muscle inhibition? First, let's discuss proton accumulation and the resulting acute metabolic acidosis. Now, if you remember, I indicated that fatigue is simply a situation in which the muscle inhibits itself as a way to relieve itself from a hypoxic stress. So this means that there is some mechanism associated with hypoxia that interferes with the process of muscle contraction. If muscle contraction processes are interfered with, how would that affect the ATP and thus oxygen demand of the muscle cells? It would clearly decrease the demand for ATP and thus oxygen because the muscle is quote unquote slowing itself down. This would in turn mitigate hypoxia in the cell. Again, the muscle inhibition that characterizes fatigue is an acute stress response. More specifically, an acute stress relief response. So how does proton accumulation in muscle cells during a hypoxic post anaerobic threshold state interfere with the processes of muscle contractions? When protons accumulate and your muscle cells undergo acidification, particularly to a pH below seven, several processes that are critical for muscle contractions are inhibited. First, as glycolysis ramps up to help meet the ATP demand during post anaerobic threshold exercise, as we discussed earlier, the ensuing proton accumulation will in turn slow glycolysis down, again, for the sake of slowing down the muscle. How would inhibiting glycolysis in turn inhibit muscle contractions? It would inhibit ATP production, which would in turn inhibit muscle contractions. Remember, glycolysis is one of the important anaerobic processes that backs up the aerobic systems during post anaerobic threshold exercise to help meet the ATP demand. So in essence, the more glycolysis ramps up, the more it will eventually be inhibited because when glycolysis ramps up further, that means you are further in the post anaerobic threshold hypoxic zone. In summary, glycolysis contributes to proton accumulation and proton accumulation will eventually inhibit glycolysis thereby inhibiting muscle contractions. So how does proton accumulation cause an inhibition of glycolysis? It slows down glycolysis through the inhibition of the enzyme phosphofructokinase, which is the rate limiting enzyme of glycolysis. A rate limiting enzyme is an enzyme that controls how active a metabolic pathway is such as glycolysis. In other words, when phosphofructokinase is highly active, Glycolysis is highly active and vice versa. So proton accumulation, more directly the resulting acidification, is adverse to phosphofructokinase activity. It suppresses its activity, which in turn will slow glycolysis down. As a result, the rate of ATP production will slow down, which will in turn, quote unquote, slow down muscle contractions thereby reducing the ATP and oxygen demand of the muscle. This will then translate to a forced decrease in muscular performance, putting you into a pre-anaerobic threshold, non-hypoxic workload. Second, proton accumulation and the resulting acute metabolic acidosis can inhibit cross bridge formation between the thick and thin filament. Remember, cross bridge formation is a critical process in muscle contractions. Now this will require a bit of memory of your exercise physiology course, but if you remember, in order for the thick and thin filament to form a cross bridge connection, the binding sites for myosin to attach to must be exposed on the thin filament. And if you remember, in order for the binding site to be exposed, tropomyosin, as you see here as a long linear protein, must be removed off of these binding sites. Tropomyosin is removed off of the binding sites by another protein called troponin. And troponin knows to remove tropomyosin off of the binding sites when calcium binds to it. So if calcium can't bind to troponin, the tropomyosin can't be removed off of the binding sites, and myosin cannot form a cross bridge with the thin filament. This would in turn interfere with the sliding filament process and thus muscle contraction. The calcium binding sites on troponin is sensitive to pH, in that when pH decreases, like during post anaerobic threshold hypoxic situations, 
the binding potential with calcium is reduced significantly. So in summary, proton accumulation and the resulting acute metabolic acidosis reduces overall muscle contractility by one, slowing down glycolysis after it ramps up, thereby reducing the rate of ATP production, and two, by inhibiting cross-bridge formation by reducing the binding of calcium to troponin. Now, how else can proton accumulation in the muscle inhibit muscle contractions? How else can it cause fatigue? Another way is not through a direct inhibition of muscle contraction processes like presented here in these two bullets, but also indirectly through the stimulation of pain. We often describe this pain during high intensity exercise as burning pain. We've all experienced this. Fundamentally speaking, what is pain and what is the purpose of pain? The biological purpose of pain is protection. It is sensory information indicating that there is a stressor present. For example, if you pinch your skin lightly, you sense touch. This is called a mechanical stimulus. But if you pinch harder and harder, this mechanical stimulus increases. Eventually, that pinch will induce pain. This is when the mechanical stimulus exceeds a certain threshold, at which point it becomes a noxious stimulus, N-O-X-I-O-U-S, a noxious stimulus, which means pain stimulus. In other words, the sensation of touch becomes the sensation of pain. The process by which the sensory nervous system through sensory neurons, like those in your skin, detects a noxious stimulus and induces pain is called nociception, N-O-C-I-C-E-P-T-I-O-N. Nociception is in essence the process of pain. So as you pinch your skin harder and harder and you sense pain, what happens? What does the pain do? Pain causes you to stop pinching your skin. So why do you think you pinching your skin at a certain intensity causes pain? Because the pinching at a certain degree was perceived as a threat to your body, particularly your skin cells. That mechanical stimulus turned into a mechanical stress and thus into a noxious stimulus to tell you that the pinch has reached a level that may damage your skin. The pain caused you to stop pinching your skin and thus the stress is removed. As you can see, pain is an acute stress response mechanism, more specifically, an acute stress relief mechanism. When you place your hand on the hot stove, there is pain because the thermal stimuli exceeded a certain threshold, making that thermal stimuli a noxious stimuli causing nociception or pain. This causes you to remove your hand from the hot stove immediately, thereby relieving your skin from the stress and protecting your skin from damage. So how does this relate to the pain you feel during heavy exercise? And how is it related to the hypoxic stress that you experience during post-anaerobic threshold exercise? Let's go ahead and answer these questions through this figure. Starting on the left, you have a subject exercising at a post-anaerobic threshold workload. To keep it simple, let's just say the subject is performing an all-out set of weighted back squats. As we discussed earlier, due to the rapid ATP hydrolysis and redox reactions and the limitation of the mitochondria due to the hypoxic state, there is an accumulation of free protons. When the protons accumulate to a certain degree or threshold, they can become a noxious stimulus. Again, a pain stimulus. I'll say that one more time. When the protons accumulate to a certain degree or threshold, they can become a noxious stimulus, which again is a pain stimulus. You see, surrounding your muscles, you have tons of sensory neurons that detect a variety of stimuli. And many of these sensory neurons are what we call nociceptors, which have the ability to detect noxious stimuli and transmit those signals to the CNS. Now, as I said earlier, the proton accumulation can be a noxious stimuli, just like the pinch on the skin. There are specialized receptors on these nociceptors that detect a variety of stimuli, such as mechanical, thermal, and chemical stimuli. One of the chemical or chemo receptors on these muscle nociceptors is called ASICs, which stands for Acid Sensing Ion Channels. ASICs are triggered when protons accumulate beyond a specific level. Protons can bind to the ASICs 
and cause them to depolarize the nociceptor. The signals are then transmitted towards the central nervous system in the afferent direction. Afferent meaning towards the CNS from the periphery, the periphery being the muscle. When these signals reach the CNS, they can cause the sensation of pain or that burning sensation, if you will, in your muscles. So then what does this pain do? It stops you from doing whatever it is that is causing the pain, which in this case would be exercising at that certain intensity, which in this example was that all out weighted back squat. Pain is a biological stop signal. It is telling you to stop doing what you're doing because it is causing stress to your muscles, which can eventually damage your muscles. Pain is trying to protect your muscles. So what is that stress the pain is protecting the muscle against? It is again, hypoxia, and also the resulting acute metabolic acidosis. So as you can see, the pain during heavy exercise, as well as the fatigue or muscle inhibition, work together to relieve your muscles from this hypoxic stress. This is the very same concept as the pain you experience when you pinch your skin hard enough or you accidentally touch a hot stove. Now also to add, the degree of pain is directly related to the degree of stress. As you know, the pain is more severe if you pinch harder. This is because there's more noxious stimuli. So as exercise intensity increases towards maximum intensity, the noxious stimuli in the form of these protons becomes more severe and thus the pain becomes more severe. So think of the types of exercises that burns the most. Next time you experience that burn, go over in your head what is happening physiologically as described here in this slide. Now in a couple slides, I will discuss why you experience this nociception more severely during say resistance exercise. Stay tuned. So in summary, pain or nociception due to the proton accumulation becoming a noxious stimuli is part of the acute stress response mechanism to relieve your muscles from that hypoxic stress and the resulting acute metabolic acidosis. And pain and fatigue go hand in hand, meaning they both serve the same purpose during post anaerobic threshold exercise. It is stress relief. Now, as a side note, Remember, lactate, or what people refer to as lactic acid, again, not the same thing, is not the cause of this pain because it is not the cause of the mechanisms underlying the pain, which is the proton accumulation and the resulting acidosis. Thus, lactic acidosis or lactic acid buildup is not the cause of that burning sensation during fatiguing exercise. At this point of this lecture series, you should now understand why. Now, other than proton accumulation, I also indicated that the accumulation of inorganic phosphates in the sarcoplasm also contributes to acute muscular fatigue and is a part of this stress response mechanism. However, keep in mind that inorganic phosphate accumulation does not contribute to acute metabolic acidosis, but it contributes to fatigue. So how does inorganic phosphate accumulation cause fatigue? More specifically, how does it inhibit muscle contractions? The effect of inorganic phosphate accumulation on muscle contractions is very direct, meaning it directly interferes with processes critical for muscle contraction. First, as a brief review of exercise physiology, we should know that once a neural signal reaches the muscle fiber from the motor neuron, the muscle fibers depolarize, meaning action potentials are produced. As you see in this figure, the action potential propagates or travels across the muscle fiber and down the transverse tubule, or T-tubules, which is a passageway for the action potential that dips into the muscle fiber. From there, the dehydropyridine receptors are activated upon detecting the action potential. This would essentially open up the bottle cap of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which houses the intracellular calcium inside muscle cells. This would allow calcium to exit the sarcoplasmic reticulum. As I mentioned earlier, the calcium would then bind to troponin on the thin filament, which would then remove tropomyosin off of the crossbridge binding sites. This would allow for crossbridge formation and thus contraction. So when inorganic phosphates accumulate to a certain degree, this entire mechanism is interfered with, particularly in two areas. One, 
inorganic phosphate, when accumulated, can prevent calcium release by the sarcoplasmic reticulum by precipitating with calcium, forming calcium phosphate. This prevents calcium from exiting the sarcoplasmic reticulum and thus binding to troponin. Second, inorganic phosphates, when accumulated, can block calcium from also binding with troponin. So in summary, inorganic phosphate accumulation interferes with the role of calcium during contraction, thereby inhibiting muscle contraction. So in summary, proton accumulation and inorganic phosphate accumulation both inhibit muscle contractions by interfering with the contraction process. Proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation prevents binding of calcium to troponin and thus inhibits cross bridge formation. Inorganic phosphate accumulation also inhibits the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Proton accumulation also stimulates nociception or pain, which can also indirectly inhibit muscle contractions. These are the mechanisms connecting the stress of hypoxia during post anaerobic threshold exercise to acute muscular fatigue. So this is a very important summary for you to understand before moving forward. Now remember this important fact, fatigue overrides effort, meaning no matter how hard you are trying, fatigue will force your muscles to slow down. And we can see this from a physiological perspective as well. Let's go ahead and look at this figure again for an example. The muscle cells during fatigue are receiving plenty of neurostimuli since neurostimulation of the muscle is voluntary. Since you are putting forth as much effort as possible, the neurostimuli is very high. So even though your muscle cells are neurally stimulated sufficiently, the muscle's force output is decreasing because of fatigue. This is because the mechanisms of fatigue involving proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation occurs after the neural stimulation of the muscle cell. As you see here, neural stimulation is up here. The effects of inorganic phosphate accumulation is down here. And same with the effects of proton accumulation. So no matter how much neurostimulation there is, the machinery for muscle contractions are being inhibited by proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation. This is why no matter how hard your voluntary efforts are, say like during an all-out sprint, fatigue will occur and force you into a lower work output. Remember, fatigue is a forced reduction in muscle contractility, again, due to a hypoxic stress. Now, when I ask students during what type of exercise do you experience the most fatigue and the most pain, most of the time students will say resistance exercise. We generally know that resistance exercise is very fatiguing. When you contract against a heavy resistance, you know that you cannot sustain the same force production from the first rep through multiple repetitions. You know that eventually rep after rep, the movement will slow down and eventually you won't be able to move that weight. You also know that one of the reasons why you eventually stop your reps during a set is not just because of fatigue, but also because of that burning pain. So the question is, why is resistance exercise so acutely fatiguing? Why is it that during a set of resistance exercise, you experience the fatigue most severely? By now you understand that proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation are the mechanisms causing fatigue through inhibition of muscle contractions and sometimes pain. We also know that the proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation occurs during a hypoxic state. So this means exercise in which fatigue effects are most severe, like during resistance exercise, the hypoxic stress is most severe. And this is the case for resistance exercise. During high tension and high force exercise, like when you perform a set of dumbbell curls, there is a severe hypoxic stress in the active muscle cells. And so why is the muscle cell under such severe hypoxic stress? Is it because there is a very high oxygen demand in the muscle? Partly yes, but not so much. It is because the oxygen delivery to the muscle cells is impaired when the muscle is undergoing high tension contractions, more specifically, high tension sustained contractions. You see, during high tension contractions like during dumbbell bicep curls, the bicep muscles are in a constant contracted state throughout the entire repetition, unless of course you relax your muscle at the end of each rep, which most people don't. Usually your muscles remain contracted even at the bottom of the rep and at the top of the rep. When muscles contract, there is compression of blood vessels, including arterial blood vessels that deliver oxygen to the muscle cells.
Therefore, when there is a constant state of high tension contraction, like during a set of dumbbell bicep curls, the oxygenated blood flow to the bicep muscle cells are being restricted, and thus the oxygen delivery is restricted. And if the oxygen delivery is restricted, then the oxygen availability is reduced. And thus, aerobic ATP production becomes more limited as we see reflected in the figure to the right compared to the figure on the left. The anaerobic threshold and aerobic capacity are drastically reduced and thus the biceps during the dumbbell curl set is in a very post-anaerobic threshold and hypoxic state. And thus the bicep muscles experiences inorganic phosphate accumulation as well as proton accumulation and acute metabolic acidosis more severely. This is why as you increase the resistance, there is more fatigue because there's more tension and more restriction of arterial blood flow in addition to the increased oxygen demand. In other words, the more resistance, the more hypoxic stress. An easy experiment to test this effect would be for you to raise your arms up to shoulder level and just hold it there. Your shoulder muscles, like your deltoids and trapezius muscles, are under constant tension to keep that arm up. Eventually, you know it will become harder and harder to keep that arm up. In other words, you will fatigue and no matter how hard you are trying, the arm is going to lower itself. Also, you will likely experience the burning pain in your shoulder, which we said was an indication that there is a lot of hypoxic stress and acute acidosis in the muscle cells. Eventually, you will be forced to drop your arms. You see, simply lifting your arm up is not high intensity. It is not a post-anaerobic threshold workload. But when you hold your arm up, that constant tension is restricting flow of oxygenated blood to your shoulder muscles, which are responsible for holding your arm up. So the shoulder muscles in this situation have a reduced anaerobic threshold due to severely limited oxygen availability. Thus, there would be high amounts of proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation in those muscle cells, and thus fatigue would be very severe. Well, we can quantify this effect using a muscle oximeter, which is similar to a pulse oximeter that you can put on your finger to measure oxygen saturation in your blood. A muscle oximeter measures oxygen saturation in muscle blood vessels. If I place this device on your shoulders during this experiment, you will see that the muscle oxygen saturation will decrease, which indicates that the delivery of oxygen is less than the rate of consumption and utilization. In other words, the oxygen runs out. At the point where the oxygen saturation dips too low, this is the point where you will experience the fatigue and possibly pain because you know now this is when the hypoxic stress occurs. So again, in summary, because of the high tension sustained contractions during resistance exercise, aerobic ATP production in those active muscle cells will be severely restricted. And this is because of restricted arterial blood flow, the flow of oxygenated blood. And this explains why resistance exercise is so acutely fatiguing. Now up to this point, we have discussed the mechanisms underlying acute muscular fatigue, and we should recognize that these mechanisms occur in the muscle itself. The hypoxia is in the muscle, the proton and inorganic phosphate accumulation is in the muscle, and this inhibition of muscle contraction is in the muscle, and the pain we experience sometimes is initiated in the muscle. This mechanism of fatigue is referred commonly as peripheral fatigue. So acute muscular fatigue is peripheral fatigue. Muscle is a peripheral tissue, meaning it is outside of the central nervous system or CNS. And so when we describe fatigue as peripheral fatigue, as we have discussed thus far, it is indicating that the mechanisms underlying the fatigue is occurring in the muscle itself. So now the question is, is fatigue simply regulated only at the peripheral level, meaning only at the muscle? Is there anything outside of the muscle that can fatigue the muscle? Again, fundamentally as a means of protection. Yes, there is. And this is referred to as central fatigue. The term central is in reference to the central nervous system, which is the ultimate command center that controls the peripheral tissues like muscle. We know that in order for you to produce a muscle contraction, the CNS initiates the process by transmitting signals to the muscle you want to contract. So if those signals from the CNS to the muscle are inhibited, then how would that affect muscle contractility? It would suppress it and manifest in fatigue. So how does central fatigue work and in what circumstances does it come into play? Now the easiest way to explain central fatigue is by using an example of a resistance exercise bout. 
During a resistance exercise session, you have multiple sets across multiple exercises per muscle. As we know, during each set, the muscles experience acute muscular fatigue. In other words, as just described earlier, it experiences peripheral fatigue. And again, this is due to the hypoxic stressor and the ensuing acute acidosis, as well as the inorganic phosphate accumulation, resulting in the inhibition of muscle contractions and oftentimes pain. This occurs within each set, and we know fatigue is expressed by reduction in performance from rep to rep. We know that within each set, the efficiency of each repetition decreases one after another. Now, after you perform a set of reps, you rest. And during the rest, the muscle is completely relieved of the hypoxic stress. So you would expect that the next set would be performed to the same level as the previous set. And the third set and the fourth set and so forth would just all be performed the same. But you know that's not the case. You know that one set after another, the performance declines overall. It is common for you to perform less repetitions from one set to the next. In other words, from one set to the next, you fatigue faster during each set. Then you go to the next exercise for that same muscle. And you know you can't perform the reps as efficiently. You may say that the fatigue from the previous exercise is negatively affecting the next exercise. This is a very common circumstance during a resistance exercise bout. So why is this the case? Why does fatigue overall accumulate in the muscle throughout repeated sets of exercise? One of the explanations is central fatigue, and this is largely mediated from feedback from the muscle to the CNS. Now during each set, there is hypoxia in the cells, and thus there is acute metabolic acidosis. The acidosis eventually makes you stop the set through fatigue. Then you rest, and the hypoxia and thus the acidosis will go away. And then you start your next set, and the cycle continues. So during each set, during which time your muscle cells are hypoxic and under acidosis, I mentioned that the protons accumulating can trigger sensory neurons. And sometimes when the protons accumulate to a certain degree, pain can be triggered through those sensory neurons. These sensory neurons are referred to as the group 3 and group 4 afferents, which is another way to describe sensory neurons since they transmit signals away from the peripheral tissue and towards the CNS, the afferent direction. Now these group 3 and 4 afferents are stimulated in the presence of proton accumulation and thus acidosis, regardless of whether there is pain or not, meaning any level of proton accumulation can stimulate these neurons. So as you perform one set after another, these group 3 and 4 sensory neurons are stimulated. And thus, throughout your entire exercise bout, you could say that these sensory neurons are constantly stimulated since each set would cause proton accumulation. When there is perpetual constant stimulation of these group 3 and 4 sensory neurons, there is in turn inhibition at the central nervous system. More specifically, these group and 3 4 sensory neurons, when perpetually stimulated, can in turn inhibit motor neurons, which are responsible for carrying signals towards the muscle to contract it. This inhibition occurs before the motor cortex, where the activation of motor neurons are initiated. In other words, group 3 and 4 sensory neurons can inhibit motor neurons upstream of the motor cortex. Thus, when the motor neurons are suppressed, there is less stimulation of the motor neurons. The muscle receives less neural drive or stimulation. In turn, the total number of muscle fibers stimulated and thus performing contractions during the exercise is overall reduced. So in summary, there is less neural or motor drive to the muscle as the muscle experiences repeated exposures to acute metabolic acidosis from one set to another. This is again a protective mechanism. It is a negative feedback loop. The muscle is telling the CNS through these sensory neurons that it is undergoing repeated exposures of hypoxic stress and acidosis. So the CNS in turn then reduces the neural drive to the muscle to reduce muscle contractions and to protect it from this hypoxic stressor. And this is why as you proceed through your exercise bout, the muscle becomes more and more fatigued after repeated exposures to hypoxia and acute acidosis. So a sample exam question related to central fatigue could be, which of the following explains the overall reduction in muscular force production across an entire bout consisting of repeated sets of post-anaerobic threshold exercise? 
The answer would be central fatigue. And what explains the reduction in force production across repetitions during a single set of post anaerobic threshold exercise? It would be peripheral fatigue or acute muscular fatigue. Now this slide explains the buffering systems that our body utilizes to deal with situations of acute metabolic acidosis, like during post anaerobic threshold exercise. Buffering systems are utilized to neutralize pH during situations in which protons accumulate. Essentially, they serve to reduce the level of free protons in a solution, whether it is the muscle sarcoplasm or the blood. Of course, there are times when the buffering systems are overwhelmed and we experience fatigue and sometimes pain. This is usually the case during post anaerobic threshold exercise, especially maximum intensity exercise. Acute muscular fatigue is the last line of defense during a state of acidosis. The buffering systems are the first line of defense. I'll say that again. Acute muscular fatigue is the last line of defense during a state of acidosis. The buffering systems are the first line of defense. When acidosis overwhelms the first line of defense, the muscle will inhibit itself to reduce the acidosis, i.e. fatigue. So what are the first lines of defense? What are the buffering systems your body utilizes during exercise to deal with acidosis? We can categorize the two buffering systems as intramyocellular and extramyocellular. In other words, inside the muscle cell and outside the muscle cell, respectively. The intracellular buffering system is the carnosine buffering system, and the extracellular system is called the bicarbonate buffering system. Let's discuss. First, we have the carnosine buffering system, which I indicated was the intramyocellular buffering system. So this system tackles proton accumulation inside the muscle cell. Now, carnosine is a dipeptide, which is comprised of two amino acids, beta alanine and histidine. Carnosine is quite abundant in skeletal muscle cells because it is a good buffer since it has a similar pKa as the cell's sarcoplasm, which is 6.8, meaning they are weak acids and absorb protons as opposed to releasing them. So when the sarcoplasm pH decreases, carnosine serves to help neutralize the pH by absorbing free protons. Of course, when the proton accumulation exceeds the rate at which carnosine can buffer them, there will be a state of acute metabolic acidosis and fatigue. So there may be a natural question of whether increasing carnosine levels in the muscle cells can improve performance by improving the buffering capacity inside muscle cells. And there is research evidence to suggest that this is possible. Evidence indicates that by increasing carnosine in muscle cells, there can be better defense against acidosis. Well, this is very much observed in single cell experiments where we can put the cells in an acidic environment and manipulate the carnosine levels in the cell. And we see that when we put more carnosine inside the muscle cells, there is better neutralization of the pH. But how can we do this in muscle cells in an intact organism like the human body? Can we increase muscle carnosine levels? Yes, we can. One way we can do this is nutritionally. We can increase muscle carnosine levels through increased consumption of one of its amino acid constituents. This is beta alanine. Beta alanine is the rate limiting amino acid for carnosine synthesis, meaning carnosine production is regulated by the availability of intramyocellular beta alanine. This is not the case with histidine, meaning more histidine in muscle cells do not affect carnosine synthesis. So this gave rise to the idea of supplementing the diet with beta alanine. So we see tons of different supplement products out there, especially sports supplements with beta alanine in it. The research shows that with beta alanine supplementation, there is increased muscle carnosine levels. But does this translate to improved performance and less fatigue? This is where the evidence is mixed. But when we look at the overall body of evidence on the effects of beta alanine supplementation, it appears that the effects are more substantial during exercise intensities right around your anaerobic threshold, meaning it can help minimize fatigue at your anaerobic threshold. So this means you may be able to improve your steady state muscular power output, whether it's running speed or cycling speed and so forth. So this means you may be able to improve your steady state muscular power output, meaning perhaps you can run a little bit faster at steady state. Beta alanine supplementation, on the other hand, does not appear to be beneficial during intensities significantly above your anaerobic threshold, like during all out sprint efforts or high intensity resistance training.
This is because the metabolic acidosis during those exercise situations will always exceed the buffering capacity of the carnosine system, regardless of whether you have slightly more carnosine in the muscle cells due to beta alanine supplementation. Now the issue here is that the individuals who supplement beta alanine the most are those who lift weights and perform high to max intensity intermittent exercise. Again, beta alanine supplementation may improve muscle carnosine levels, but this will not translate to improved performance and less fatigue during exercise significantly above the anaerobic threshold. So during what situations would beta alanine supplementation be most beneficial? During steady state exercise that is right at your anaerobic threshold intensity. So if your anaerobic threshold is at a running speed of 6 miles per hour, and so your steady state running speed is at 5.5 miles per hour, increasing muscle carnosine levels through beta alanine supplementation may allow you to run at 6 miles per hour without fatigue. And again, that is simply because your intracellular buffering capacity has improved. So with that said, what population of athletes would beta alanine supplementation be most beneficial for? Endurance athletes who need to do as much muscular work across a prolonged period without fatigue. Therefore, if you have friends who consume beta alanine but only do maximum intensity exercise like resistance exercise, CrossFit, high intensity interval training, sprint interval training, it would most likely not provide any benefit since this type of exercise will always result in acute acidosis that will always exceed the buffering capacity of the carnosine system regardless of whether there is increased levels of carnosine inside your muscle cells. Now later on we will also discuss that carnosine levels in muscle cells naturally increase in response to training, especially training that stresses the carnosine buffering system meaning this is an adaptive response to exercise that is above the anaerobic threshold. Now in part two of this lecture series, we will discuss this a lot further. Okay, so now what about the extracellular buffering system? This buffering system is described as systemic, meaning it is the buffering system for your entire body. And it is mainly there to neutralize blood pH since blood affects all cells in the body. As I indicated earlier, your extra myocellular buffering system is called the bicarbonate system, and it is regulated through sensory receptors and breathing. We know as we increase intensity, our breathing rate increases. In other words, ventilation increases. This is primarily due to the need to consume more oxygen. However, at a certain higher intensity, our ventilation increases exponentially meaning we begin to hyperventilate. The point at which you begin to hyperventilate is your anaerobic threshold. And this point is also referred to as the ventilatory threshold. So anaerobic threshold and ventilatory threshold go hand in hand. So now we know that this increased hyperventilation response is related to the anaerobic threshold. At the anaerobic threshold, we know that protons are going to accumulate and create an acute state of metabolic acidosis. This will also negatively affect the pH of blood because there will be an increase in free protons released to the blood. So this decrease in blood pH will be detected by receptors called chemoreceptors. And this in turn will tell the CNS to increase breathing rate or ventilation. So why does an increase in protons in the blood cause this reflexive increase in ventilation? It is because by increasing ventilation, there is increased exhaustion of carbon dioxide. So the hyperventilation observed at the anaerobic threshold is not because of an exponentially increased need for oxygen consumption, but rather an exponentially increased need to get rid of carbon dioxide from your blood. So how does this affect blood pH and counter acidosis? To explain this, let's turn to this figure here. Here in the middle, we have carbonic acid. And on both sides of carbonic acid, we have reactions. On this side, we have carbon dioxide plus water. And on the other side, we have a proton and bicarbonate. Now the basics of blood chemistry is that the body strives to maintain chemical equilibrium in the blood. In other words, the body strives to keep both sides of carbonic acid at equilibrium. This reaction, and this reaction at balance. It wants to make sure all of this is balanced out. However, during post anaerobic threshold exercise, the muscle is releasing more free protons into the blood. So now the right side 
of the formula is increasing, particularly here. And in so doing, chemical equilibrium is disrupted. So how does your body reestablish equilibrium? Like I said, the increase in free protons will decrease pH will be detected by chemoreceptors. And this will cause hyperventilation. Through hyperventilation, you are exhausting more CO2. In other words, hyperventilation will decrease CO2 in the blood. So in accordance to this figure, it will decrease the left side. To create equilibrium here, the reaction shown here will be pushed to the left to bring CO2 back up. And in so doing, the protons will decrease. The protons will be absorbed by bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid will be used to form CO2 and H2O. In so doing, this will raise CO2 back up to reestablish chemical equilibrium. So hyperventilation during post-anaerobic threshold exercise is to exhaust more CO2 to reduce CO2 in the blood, to force this reaction from the right to the left so that the protons can be absorbed by bicarbonate. And this is how increasing levels of proton and reduced pH is buffered systemically. Since proton accumulation triggers this response, we can use ventilation as an indicator of the anaerobic threshold. As I mentioned earlier, the hyperventilation response occurs when pH decreases, which occurs at your anaerobic threshold. So the point at which you begin to hyperventilate is the point at which the anaerobic threshold is observed. This is why we use ventilatory threshold as a way to measure one's anaerobic threshold. They go hand in hand. So if I ask the question, which way does this reaction go during hyperventilation at one's anaerobic threshold? It would be to the left. And if I ask, which of the following explains why we have exponential increase in ventilation at the anaerobic threshold? It is because we want to exhaust more CO2 to reduce CO2 in the blood, not because we need to consume more oxygen. This now concludes part one of this lecture series focused on acute muscular fatigue. Now that we have a deeper understanding of acute muscular fatigue and the whys and hows, we can now have an advanced understanding of how to reduce fatigue, more specifically how to perform greater amount of muscular work without fatigue. We understand that the fundamental aspect of reducing fatigue at higher workloads is to increase the power of the aerobic system so that the aerobic system can meet the ATP demand to avoid the energy void and hypoxia. It's all about the aerobic system. As I highly emphasized earlier in this lecture series, anaerobic fitness is not a thing. It does not make any sense. Why would you want to be more reliant on your anaerobic system? This just means that your aerobic system's ATP producing power is very low. So ultimately, conditioning is largely predicated on improving the aerobic system, mainly through better delivery of oxygen and greater aerobic power plants, the mitochondria. So in part two, we will discuss the fundamental science behind conditioning programs and address the question of how do we become less fatigued at greater muscular workloads. Again, to reiterate, the reason why it is so important for you to understand acute muscular fatigue because it is the most limiting factor to human performance and general physical functioning. Experiencing fatigue doing simple tasks like walking can reduce the overall quality of life. Experiencing fatigue at a running speed of 6 miles per hour while your opponent experiences the same fatigue at running speeds of 8 miles per hour is going to limit your performance in sports. Fatigue will be relevant to whatever fields you go into, whether it is physical therapy, occupational therapy, strength and conditioning, fitness, and so forth. So now that you have an advanced understanding of fatigue, you now have a strong foundation to learn about conditioning and the fundamental basis of any effective conditioning program.